possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. You're See? See? He's like... In 1934, when he was 25 years old, he created a revolutionary book called A Field Guide to the Birds. It was the first to present birds in a simple, straightforward way that has made it possible for anyone to explore the diversity and wonder of nature. The son of immigrants, Peterson grew up among the factories of Jamestown, New York. He was a rebellious loner who spent much of his time in the woods, where he developed an exceptional awareness of the natural world. His ability to share his passion for nature, and especially for birds, has made Roger Torrey Peterson the most celebrated naturalist of our time. When I was a teenager, it symbolized freedom. I don't think I was the best uh, in school. And the, the mere sight of a bird would excite me so much that I simply couldn't control it. I reacted. Uh, I wish I had wings as they had. Could go where I want to, when I want to. Of course, it wasn't quite as simple as all that, but. In any event, the birds seem to symbolize that kind of uh, freedom that I would have given my soul to have. What really hooked me on birds was uh, when I was about the age of 11, our teacher in the seventh grade, Miss Hornbeck, started a junior Audubon club. It was the following weekend that I think I was really hooked. It was Saturday, and my friend Carl Hammerstrom, who lived up the street and i decided to explore south of town so we crossed the railroad tracks went up across swede hill to the old reservoir and there on an oak tree or maybe it was a maple uh, there was a uh, bundle of brown feathers it was a flicker that was asleep apparently uh, tired from migration but i thought it was dead so very gingerly i poked it and this inert bunch of feathers all of a sudden sprang to life with, with wild eyes, looked at us, and then flashed away and with all, all that gold under its wings. And it was the contrast between what I thought was dead and was very much alive. And uh, it was one way of drawing together my past experience. In other words, the essence of a bird, as I conceive it. His artistic ability was evident from an early age. When Peterson graduated from high school in 1925 at the age of 16, he was hired to paint intricate designs at a Jamestown furniture factory. I loved to draw birds, and I would film the margins of my history book with little sketches. That's why I almost flunked history. But. Uh, it was a decision I had to make. Should I go to uh, Cornell and study biology, or should I go to the National Academy of Design, the Art Students League in New York, and study painting? I decided I was basically an artist, and so I went to New York instead to study at the League and the Academy. And it was there that I was able to uh, learn to put things down and pull things together. New York City doesn't seem like the ideal place for a young naturalist, but the parks are magnets for migrating birds. And it was here, in places like Central Park, that Peterson fell in with a small group called the Bronx County Bird Club, a group on the cutting edge of modern bird watching. That was way back in the days when most bird identification was done over the sights of a shotgun. Ornithology was in that shotgun period, the specimen tray. But more and more, there were field observers who were uh, finding out some of the tricks of telling a bird at a distance. And it always seemed to me that the old handbooks made bird identification much more uh, clumsy and difficult than it was. They'd start uh, describing a robin, starting at the tip of the beak and ending with a tail. And only halfway down the description would you uh, learn that the robin had a red breast. It always seemed to me that there's a, there could be a much more direct way of showing these things. And that's really why my field guide was born. 
Had I not been an art student, I don't think I could have done it. Had I taken the usual route, the usual way of going through some university, I might have been too inhibited, too formal, to have presented things in this simple way for the average person. My field guide illustration is a different art form, you might say. It's schematic, um, without third dimensional activity or without too much of it. Patternistic with the same position for each bird so you can make an easy comparison. And the critical field marks are pointed to with, with little arrows so that you can't go wrong. Our backyard, there's a lot going on, just as dynamic uh, interactions as uh, lions shooting the bell. He came the chicken in, he said, timing. He came this, to the feeding area, right to the back lawn, this huge chickadee that had a wings about <laughs> six feet and a naked red head with a turkey vulture, but everything was a chicken. <laughs> his, uh, his wife finally hooked him on her and he learned how to discriminate. To discriminate. But uh, chicken, yeah, we'll chickadees of... are always with us, so we'll ignore him. <laughs> Paul, was he describing your first experience? Uh, recognized that as being distinct. He called it the short-legged peewit flycatcher. Then it was ignored, lumped with the, with the uh, willow, which is further west. Now they've come together. They are different species. But these little flycatchers are so similar, some of them, that, uh, that they confuse me even to the experts. And all this has grown up since. We, we used to be, uh, I remember in the old days, a lot of uh, showy orcas. And then they disappeared for years. Now I think, I'm told they're coming back. I'm almost pasture-like mm -hmm. in the old days. And uh, there was Olsen's Woods and Peterson's, I think it was part of Peterson's pasture. Uh -huh. That's what it was called. It's earlier, uh, and in a recent day, we had at least a dozen species of birds within hearing. There was a blue jay, and cat birds, and and towies and all that sort of thing. Or jays, of course. My ears are still pretty good. My age, uh, usually, uh, people lose the higher registry by the time they're in their 50s. I've just, the last year or two, lost uh, two or three birds. Cedar wax and black pole warbler. Of course, birds of the middle range, you always hear. My eyes are my problem. I've had cataracts removed, and I have to work like the devil when I'm painting. Photography is quite easy, because as long as you can see a picture, these new cameras will do all the focusing for you. But they won't, still won't see the picture. You still have to use judgment. But most people think that if you point and shoot, they've got a picture. about these things. Bob Sundell is the number one birder from this area. You are, aren't you, still? Yes. No, not, not, not really. Yes, he is. <laughs> yes, he is. Yes, yes. yes, he is, by far. And so, uh,
That always used to be one of my favorites, and that, curiously enough, uh, that's a sound that turns up in several of the advertisements. I don't know whether they dubbed them in. You remember? I, I, I just uh, heard that uh, last evening, and I've heard it many times. There, there is one I think where they... I think they're dubbing it uh, in. They're because, dubbing it in. Because it's, it happens too often to be a casual thing in the soundtrack. Right. And the, and the, and they don't show anything in, in, in the one advertisement. Was it a two-page uh, advertisement? No, this one was uh, for... Uh, uh, a wood preservative. Mm -hmm. The morning warblers in the background. The morning warblers, very obvious in yeah. the background. So uh, we birders make a list of things we hear over the air. <laughs> but that's the game of it. Uh, you see, bird watching can be many things. It can be a game or a sport or a recreation, an art, a science, whatever you choose to make it. You a bore. Or a boar, depending on your per on yourself. If you're a boar, why is the boar? Because yeah, I used to be in all the pipelines around town. Yeah, well, just see, there, there's hardly any. You still have black burning orbers in these trees? Not, uh, they're, they're, they're not like the numbers that when, when, when you were so well, that's really, you know, right across the That's really an action in Yeah. Point that out, point that out to people. Excuse me. No more than 10 people, because then I know these uh, tour leaders that lead bird tours all over the world prefer to have groups of at least one leader for every 10 people, because beyond that, why, you're lost. So if we hear anything special? No, there's nothing special, just the chickadees and the blue jays, but they're because always with us. Song, song sparrow. And a lot of gold, birds. Gold finches flying over, red winged blackbird. But those are the normal things. Uh, there are some specialties that you would hear earlier in the year here. Like? Well, the, the, the special bird right here is that older flycatcher. The older flycatcher. Which yeah. is uh, interesting. And the morning morning warbler. Morning, morning warbler. Morning warbler. Morning. Nice bird. Did you have it? You didn't have it today. No, not today. That's a bird I always like because it uh, represents James Thompson. And the birds are kind of quiet now at this time of the day. Very quiet. And there are some birds that are molting so that they, they're quiet. Sometimes as many as a dozen or more, and they suffocate to death. They claim that between five and six million bluebirds die because of those. Now they don't use those. They use something else. But the starling gets the blame for a lot just because it's an alien. But we'd lose 40% of our wildflowers if it weren't for the aliens. Remember, we're all aliens. <laughs> And so are the Indians themselves, if they go back far enough. See, this is a world where everything is, is mixing constantly. Do you worry about starlings? I've given up. <laughs> well, they're here, and they're, there's nothing you can do about them. That's They've, right. They, 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 they accepted our ways, and imagine being able to live with us. We're about the most difficult animal in the world. So I, I don't worry about house sparrows, which are nice little birds, really. Now, this is kind of a... Uh, liberated attitude. I don't know whether I'm saying the right things or not. Well, sure, they, they yeah. do have feathers. Yes, and, and uh, the only other creatures with feathers right. are the angels. <laughs> so they're <laughs> good. They must be good, though. Yeah, the concern is everybody's trying to get the bluebird back in abundance here. Yeah. No, I don't. I uh, just put up more houses. Simple as that. I the Purple Martins. And it was winter time, so I thought something's wrong. And that was my first starling, but that's way back in the 20s. So it took them that long to arrive here from uh, well, they may New have been, York, New York. They yeah. may have been here uh, a little bit before. Yes. <laughs> but I remember my first ones were 
And I think, uh, and uh, the RTP Institute uh, certainly should cooperate with you, and I hope they are. They are, very much because, so. Uh, uh, in a way, uh, we, we should use you as a model for others to follow. We're working together on a number of things. Good. It's working out Has well. it always been that way? Yes. Good. Right. You'll have to come down and see how our uh, progress we're making on our... Because I, I read the uh, boatings from uh, time to time. It sounds great. Thank you. You should see the new building, how it's progressing. I'd love to the see addition. it. I have a lot of uh, uh, prints that... Uh, when we, if you need anything in the wall space, not just prints, but uh, blow-ups of some bird photographs. See, at my age, uh, curious enough, my therapy is um, is bird photography, because my ears are no longer what they were. They're not not like Bob Sindel's. They can't hear some of the higher notes. Uh, but it's still better than it should be at my age. But my eyes are my real problem, because I've had cataracts removed, and so... Uh, 20 minutes, and you could sketch it. Well, uh, so all my old sketchbooks are full of these two birds. And uh, the thing is, you know, birds are so quick, uh, and uh, usually you think you have time to write, you get the head turned, and, and uh, one shot out of three will turn up. You can study these uh, video shots with some very good equipment now, and see what happens, and then do your studies. I do have a question for you. Did you ever get to get any pictures of the polar bear up at Churchill? I did, from a, yes, I, I got that. Good. But only from the deck of the ship. I'm just going to give a general talk that some of you may have heard before, so please bear with me, because uh, most of you forget it anyway, and so I can use <laughs> By the time I've told, there's a goldfinch flying. See that wonderful mm -hmm. zipping flight? Yeah. Yes. How many of your first field guides with the errors were printed before the errors were found? Are you talking about the... Your 1934 field guide. What's the matter? It's, it's a matter of error. Do you mean errors? Well, in the birds, the shading in the birds next to oh, the index that. that. That's a matter of, of engraving. Yes, I can always tell the first printing of the first edition, which is 2,000 copies. And um, because the on the whistling swan place, the blades weren't cleaned out of the neck. Well, was the index mistake in the same? Yes. You found at the same time? Yes. Now, what word in the index was it? It was Bob uh, Pumper instead of Bob Pumper. Uh, the nickname for the bitter. See, I have two of those books, and I wasn't sure of the index mistake. Yes, and you've got the dust jacket as well. I don't have the dust jacket. Because, you know, if you've got the dust jacket... I heard you're looking for a dust jacket. Is well, I don't true? have one myself, but it came out for $2.75. They were all gone overnight, and I got I was to get no royalty on the first thousand. I just didn't mind because no one had any money in those days. Well, now uh, they never print less than 100000 and uh, in fact, it's up to about 6 million copies, I think. But if you can get one of that first printing with a dust jacket, it's worth $1,500. Without it, it's worth probably 1000 I don't know, but as much as you can get. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the way the world is. It's, uh, <laughs> and, uh,
and for all of the efforts and for accommodating our artists for the duration of this event. From all of us artists, thank you very much. This is truly impressive. Here just two years ago, Dr. Tori Peterson spoke concerning a vision. A vision someday regarding the Roger Tori Peterson Institute. And there, the backdrop of the facility which will be dedicated today. attributes there is a, an additional dimension. Perhaps Thoreau of Walden Pond, Rachel Carlson, author of Silent Spring, and many, many others may have all been contributors to the environmental conscience of our society. But in the opinion of many here today, there is one man alone who has had the broadest impact in creating environmental awareness and he is our own native son. This is an educational institution, the purpose of which is to educate the public, especially children, about the natural world, our dependence on it, and our responsibilities for it. I believe it is Roger's wish and hope that all children of today, children who have an innate interest in nature, and have the same opportunity that he had when his seventh grade teacher aroused his interest in birds and nature. May this beautiful building that you see be the means of carrying forth all that Roger has done and be a measure of our love and respect for him and all that he stands for. Roger, we welcome It's good to be here today, and uh, I like the month of August because it's uh, bird migration going south. The only thing is they're not singing now, but there are probably more things going through than we realize. And it's particularly uh, great to be in Chautauqua County uh, because it's one of the counties uh, in our country that has, if anything, improved since I was a boy. So
you know, in all the years that Rodney and I have traveled together, and we have some of the birthday, you know, on the ships or wherever we are, and we do it in Swedish as well as in English. So I would like to sing the traditional song in Swedish as we have always been singing it when we have been together. So here it goes. My voice is fantastic, so, <laughs> so, so you have to. So, ja må han leva, ja må han leva, ja må han leva ut i hundrade år. Ja viska han leva, ja viska han leva, ja viska han leva ut i hundrade år. Och nu är ett fyrfaldigt leve för Roger. Leve han. Hurra, 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 hurra.